So yeah, you finished your high school career with a ridiculous 146, 45, 800 meters in the high school career, which is a national record. That qualified you to run in the 1996 U.S. Olympic trials in Atlanta. You actually sacrificed your high school graduation to go to this event. But talk more about how good that phone call felt when you got the invite and what it was like going for the Olympic trials. Oh, it was, um, you know, well, yeah, it was definitely something. I, I, looking back at it, you know, 20 some seven years ago, I was trying to remember how it went. Definitely excited. You know, I felt like the uh, sky wasn't the limit. I felt like there was more past that. You know, I, I had, you know, dreams of being a professional athlete and definitely going, you know, to the Olympics. You know, I felt like I had a chance to, to make it there. And um, uh, I had the whole neighbor. Bell Gardens was behind me, Bell Gardens Elementary, where I worked during the summer. They made a cake out of, you know, a cake with my image on it. They uh we were doing the Macarena. I remember just dancing the Macarena. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was great to to have like the the full support of the of not just my family, the Granvilles and the bars, but also the city of Bell Gardens really just put me on their shoulders and and it was a it was a grand community mo you know event. Um, but then you know, but the idea it was with that brief celebration, it was business as usual. I had you know I had gold on my mind. I wanted to, it was in Atlanta. You know, the, in the in the Olympics was the Olympic trials in Atlanta, and um, the Olympics was also in Atlanta that year. So it was just something that I was like, okay, I'm gonna get used to running with the big boys, and this is where it's gonna be. So it was it was totally exciting. And but you know, leading up to the event, taking that flight was all business as usual. Yeah, it's uh, when you do Olympic trials and USA Track and Field Nationals. You, yeah, you have to record a time, and you have to you know go in there. So you probably you probably saw your name. Like they don't, uh, they they may call you, but they don't really call you. It's basically like who qualifies. It's like it's yeah. Me. So it's a list. Yeah. Yeah, it's a list. Here's the mark. Here's the A mark. If you hit the exactly. A mark, you can automatically. If you hit the B mark, they go to the next B mark. So I I've been in USA Nationals plenty of times with athletes and kids, but you have to, you know, you have to declare them. You have to get them a USA Track and Field membership. You have to do all that. But right, you know, they had to be excited to see like, okay, I'm on there. And I don't remember '96. Uh, who were everyone but johnny gray yeah johnny uh, gray i mean that was you know oh man that's my man johnny gray okay. yeah that that was me i mean growing up is is just like that's if you're an 800 meter runner if you're a track you know a young track guy that name was definitely you know top of the list of who you want to be like and he and he grew and he ran with santa monica track club too yeah. which was you know you don't really see too many track clubs like this now at the professional level but they had it they were just the glory with Carl Lewis, uh, Burrell, uh, Burrell, Burrell, Steve Lewis, everybody, Steve everybody. Lewis. Man, yeah, that was a team. And here, this guy, it was uh, uh was actually in my heat. You know, <laughs> that was the yeah. that was the wild part of being of looking up. It was like, man, this is the guy. You know, I look up to, but also this is the guy I want to beat today. You know. So how how was run, how how was running at the trials? Tell me about that. So how, 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 man, that that was a whole experience. Um. You know, uh, that's where when when you hear the announcers or old ex athletes say, you know, experience is really important. You know, being mm -hmm. there before is, is something that um, will give you an advantage. And and I was used to, you know, being straight out of high school, one of the you know few high school athletes that year. Me and uh, Ob, I'm pretty sure probably a um, couple more on the girls side was there. Um, but it, it was and you're used to your certain type of warm up. This one thing was the big. Wild, wild part. So there was a, a warm up track, maybe 10, 15 minutes away from the Olympic track, the Atlanta, yep. the, the main track. And so, and then there was a lot of kind of security. So usually, you know, I'm at Cerrito, you know, in high school, you got Lone Beach State or you, you're over here at Cerritos College or, you know, local high schools. And so there's a warm up field, there's a check in, and all is within the same place. And it's kind of like a, a certain order. And you know, it's like, okay, my race is at five o'clock I probably you know start getting my mind right you know walking towards the area around 3 30 3 45 you know make sure things are there around four o'clock start doing a little jog and 10 15 minutes before we get closer to the check-in you know first second call last call this one here man it was something different you're you're they you have to take a bus and there's only certain coaches can be so yep. so close to you so it's all kind of new rules and you know you're seeing all the you know cameras you're seeing all these you know professionals that's been there before and and uh, uh, people I've seen on TV and magazines, so that was just so much going on with the young guys. But but the warm up was definitely I still remember to this day. It was like, okay, we warmed up over here in hot Atlanta, right? You warm mm -hmm. up, and then you uh, then you got to stop your warm up, and they check you in through another station to get on the bus and the security. And I think at that point, 
uh, you know, my dad was always close to me. And at that point, I was on my own, you know. Yep. And and so at that point, we, we went. And then you have to do another warm-up. You know, they kind of broke it in half. And then we were under the stadium. And that's kind of like when you did your, you know, kind of warmed up again because it was – it was so gapped. So at that point, then finally they got onto the track. Uh, and just to be on that track, I remember how fast it felt. It was a Mondo track and it was just tight to the ground. You feel as soon as your spikes grabbed into that track, you was gone and you just walk it. And so, it, and then you just see this huge stadium. You know, I never really ran in a track where it's it, the, the, the stadium surrounded the whole track, you know? So it was that going on. And then it was that Megatron. There was a big old uh, video mm -hmm. uh, uh, video board uh, TV up on the uh, going down the back stretch. So that was that was something else. So during the the first, I made it to the to the second quarterfinals. So I ran the first quarterfinals and um, was up there. I was in the lead. I ran ran my racing the running like one forty seven. But I remember uh, just running with Johnny. I'm pretty sure Johnny Gray was in that first heat. And I got spiked by Johnny Gray. It was like one. It was like a rite of passage. I'm like kind of happy about it. I still have that mark. <laughs> but these dudes, these dudes' legs were. I mean, these are Olympians. You know, their legs was started at my nose. You know, and their yep. back kick was just. I mean, I could. I remember seeing like their trail kick coming up towards my chest. I'm like, man, that's a stride. And then mm -hmm. at one point, I got the lead, and I, I, I was coming down with 500 to go, and I was looking at myself on that Megatron. It's like, man, this is cool. Mama, I made it. I'm, I'm up here running. As soon as I looked up at that uh, Megatron and boom, 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 but like yep. four <laughs> athletes just went right past me. He's like, you don't play around there. So I got my head straight back in the game, qualified for the uh, the next event, and then uh, just missed the the, fight, the semifinals uh, that second race. Yeah, it's, it's a little different. I, I've had athletes go to Eugene. and all, but Eugene now is different, but we would have oh, yeah. to, I remember in 2008, me and my athlete, we had to warm up at like uh, the high school. It was like four or five miles away. You had to get all your workouts there. You had to work out the high school. You had to actually check in there for your race, like you're saying. Then yeah. it was like, okay, you guys can check in now. You can take the shuttle back to Eugene to the to Hayward Field. And mm -hmm. then my guy had, I, then, at that point, they separated us. Yeah. Okay, you can't talk to your guy no more. You got to go yeah. this way. You got to go that way. And I had to say, whatever my last, you know, I might not see him 20, 30 minutes for the race. It's like, okay, this is what we talked about. Let's go. Yeah. And that's that's one thing. You, uh, as a coach, I would tell tell my athletes. I, need, I said, you know, I'm over here on this side. I'm holding the watch. You, you, all this stuff that we're doing in practice, there's going to be a bit a, come a point of time that you need to have mm -hmm. this embedded in your head, and you need yep. to you need to know how to you do this for yourself. I mean, you, I can't run this race for you, you know. And yep. you need to be the coach on the field. So a lot of times during our warm ups, having that background of of that Olympic trials and you know running in, in college as well, just knowing that. You know, your coach is there, but you need to be your own coach and your, your own uh, take accountability for your your training, your warm up, what you eat and and uh, how you're feeling. Yeah, the coach is good. But when it comes down to getting on the line, it's, it's all on you, especially in track. Like, like Alexander said now. So now you all right, you finished summer track. Now now you're going to UCLA your freshman year. Let's just, I guess, like he said earlier, yeah. uh, talk to us more about that. What, what do you yeah, UCLA, I mean, being in the dorms, being away from family, you know, the, you know, even though we were, you know, 20 minutes away, but it was really, you know, distant um, from, from the family. But it, it's starting to create a new family, new friends, which I still communicate with a lot of them to this day. Um, it, it was it was it was a lot of fun, uh, a lot of growing up. Uh, the track was was something foreign. It was a different, you know, coaching stuff was the first time me not being coached by my parent, by my dad. Um, and it was with John Smith and Bob Larson. And it was just a it was a way of me, you know, transitioning, trying to be on my own and 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 work out. Uh, my dad had I was kind of hearing things from my dad on one side and then obviously being on the track and getting influenced by the coaches on, on this side uh, at, at the facility. So I was kind of torn that first year of still trying to listen to my father and feeling myself kind of slip away from this tight that we had, you know, for 18 years and then trusting the process with the coaches that I had in the moment. So the, the freshman year, I ended up going pretty fast. I had some, uh, some fast indoor times, ended up going 147, in the, at um, in Notre Dame at indoors against, I oh, mean I can't think of his name right now. Rest in peace. But he was the, he was the uh, half miler miler. He um he was usually a bigger guy. I can't think of his name. Uh, yeah. Uh, I know he, he he had a toe missing from from a lawnmower accident. What school What school was he at? 
Oh, he was pro at the time. He ran with Reebok or Asics. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He was he was a pro. Mark, at the Mark time. Everett was it? Mark? Everett? No, no, not Mark Everett. He's still alive. Yeah, it's yeah. It'll, it'll it'll come it'll come back later. But um, he was a pro in the race, and he kind of let me through. And I was still running, uh, you know, trying to take it to the lead. And my coach was letting me know you got to be able to run a different race. And so my strategy for the eight hundred was kind of changing. And, and I remember things starting to fall apart once I, I qualified for the NCAA's indoors and in, at Bloomington and didn't make the finals. And that was such a devastating moment in my life. Um, I ran a different race. I tried to run from behind and then kind of lost track of where I was. And that just kind of started a, 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 a little mental, little, uh, little stick in there that kind of stuck with me throughout college of not being able to finish at the end. And was, I, I, looking back at it, I wish I would have took, you know, had seen a sports psychologist to kind of, or maybe mm -hmm. taking a break from the 800, which I didn't do until like my senior year. Mm hmm so you go to college, but your times do not improve. Yeah. Tell your audience how you go to college and then you end up regressing from high school. Yeah, each yeah each year I pretty much got a, a second slower. Um, it was one of those things where, you know, I seen it I seen it happening. It, it was, um, you know, my at some point where my relationship with my family pretty much was estranged. Uh, there was a, a point of where I just found myself as an athlete just kind of keeping my nose above water, you know, uh, figuratively and then literally, you know, I was at injuries, plantar fasciitis and find myself doing aqua drugs in the pool off in the, or, or hamstring injuries where I felt like I was getting to the moment of being able to break through that, that mental block that I had, like a writer's block. I kind of had mm -hmm. an athletic block. It was, and it always seemed to happen around that last 200 where I felt like I didn't have that, that pop. I mean, the workouts were, were amazing. I felt like I was running amazing times in practice, but it's just something that wasn't wasn't working um, with myself on the track. But again, looking back, that's one of those things I, I tell my athletes now. It's okay to talk to somebody, you know, let you know how you feel, what things are going on. Um, it's okay to have, you know, see a therapist, a sports psychologist, just to be able to 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 uh, maybe unlock whatever is locked up in your brain, what was blocking. But in that course of that. You know, growing you know growing up as an athlete and as a youth athlete through the Junior Olympic and TAC and USATF, you know I I was able to I was just running track it was just me my, focused on my race I couldn't tell you any other athlete's name pretty much unless they're in my race I couldn't uh, I tell you about a pole vault or what other exercises I would just run my race and go and as I was declining or getting slower on the track I was getting more um track savvy with with and and track and educated in track and, and field I, I started being a, a student of the sport i started being more of a um a team leader in, in any kind of way that i could be and in, in to assist my a team player so where one that growing up i excelled at being an individual athlete and with fast times but not maybe a good teammate but then in college you probably wasn't as fast as i, I wanted i wanted to reach but i definitely became a really good teammate uh team captain I, and and leader you know a lot of times i would you know in people around campus or different sports knew who i was and so that was the kind of the trade-off and i feel like the 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 mix of the dynamic of both um levels of being an athlete in a team environment really helped me as a coach later on but yeah it, it was devastating to see that those times not really reaching you know not getting faster than that 146 45 but and when you pop in popcorn you'll you know, the kernels pop at their own pace. Some pop mm -hmm. fast, some pop at the end, but, you know, it's all part of the same taste. Yeah. It's still, yeah. And that's why we're talking to this day. I mean, it's still there. Yep. Yeah, you had to have a lot of different voices in your ear. You probably, you know, um, you had your dad who coached you. Now you're with Bob Larson. He's got his distance-based background. And you got right. John Smith who had all the 400, 800 runners. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Just talk to us. Like, you have people pulling at you each way. It's like, you're supposed to be doing this. You're supposed to be doing that. You're yeah. 18. You're 18 year old going to college. You're not really supposed to be doing anything but be an 18 or 19 year old going to college. Yeah, yeah, and you get, you got a chance to see that too with a lot of the just students not being student athletes, really encompassing that whole ideal of college, socializing, socializing, um, you know, making mistakes, you know, or growing and, and everything. So all that stuff was encompassed, and still having a target on my back of being that a guy that went 146 in high school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's in, uh, that, that all happened. Um, but um, it, 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 there was some parts where it was, I just was wondering what, you know, what's this all about? What's this for? I remember um, after leaving college, I thought I was done with track 
and I got a call from Frank Gagliano. Mm -hmm. He was the yeah. coach at Georgetown. Georgetown, yep. Georgetown, amazing uh, middle distance, distant coach. And he was like, Michael, don't give it up. That, like, move up to uh, come up here. Let's recruit you to come up with the Nike farm team and let's give it another shot. And I, I remember that I was like, you know, it was just after 9 11. And I was like, you know what, let me go ahead and, and give this a shot and met with him, drove up there with a friend. And he treated me, he treated me with a lot of love and a lot of respect, which he does all his athletes. And I felt very comfortable with that. And it was great to have a, a, a change of scenery and, and hoping to maybe get on the track and doing something really good, you know, to end my seat, my career. Having been a college coach, I, uh, I think a lot of people, they, they'll look down, they'll say, they'll see what you were in high school and say you didn't have a successful collegiate career. And I tell people, no. yes, he did. He had a very yeah. successful collegiate career. Right. So he, he won two national championships to relay. That's yeah. very hard to do. And there's, and there's no weak links in college. So it's not like, Oh, he's no. a weak link. so yeah. I say that and I, and I remember your senior year and, uh, and you know, um, you ran a 400. I remember you hadn't run in a while. You were hurt. And then you ran an yeah. Oxy. You ran great. And the next week you won a Pac-10 Pac title. And I tell people, yeah. that is – I, I coached college for years. And my goals were like win a collegiate conference title and then, you know, All-American or Nationals. But it's yeah. very difficult to win a collegiate conference. Thanks for, yeah, thank especially you. Especially at that course. level. Yeah. And, and you, you actually dropped down from the eight to the four. So kind of let's talk about that. You yeah. – I was excited. I was excited to see that. I was like, oh, man. Yeah. man, man. And so, like I said, I was at the first race. I think you ran the Oxy before Pac-12. And I was like, oh, man, he's running the four. This is great. Yeah. You won. So that, that that was, um like I said earlier, I, I felt like I should have did that early to take a break from the 800 a bit just to, um you know, just kind of let what happened marinate, get my mind back right, not to feel the pressure and to try to, you know, continue. Because it was it was a lot, you know, a lot of my mind. So then in 1999, my junior year, our relay team, like you brought up, brought, broke uh, won the national uh, championship at Boise, Idaho in the four by four. Mm -hmm. I was on the first leg on that. And we had an amazing uh, string of events. Uh, the week two, a couple of weeks prior, we uh, at Pac-10 championships, we, it, we were running like 306s, 307s the whole season. And then we all happened to mesh at the right time. Me, uh, Terrence Williams, uh, uh, Malachi, Brian, Gilly, Bell, Brian, right? Brian Fell, Brian Fell. Was it, Mal was it Malachi? Was Malachi. It you, Mal Mal you, Malachi, Terrence, and Brian Fell, right? Yep, yep. And, and and we ran against uh USC with Davis on on the team. You know, they had Felix Sanchez. I think he was on that team. That I don't think yeah, he was yeah, on yeah. Felix team. Sanchez. I think Felix Sanchez. Williams, and you know, they Davis. were running 301, 302s all year. And we happened to just mesh. We did something, and we ended up going maybe like 303. Uh, just losing by the, you know by by the last fifty meters, qualifying for NCs that you know at the Pac tens at the Bell, you know at the buzzer so to speak, and so that started me really thinking about running the four hundred again, doing the open four hundred, not having the pressure of trying to catch somebody, just running a, a straight shot four hundred. I started feeling that that old school connect I had with the two and the four hundred and that real sprinter vibe, and after winning national championship and. An amazing, you know, comeback from behind fashion and running one of my fastest open splits to get the team off to a good start. Uh, I remember going to John Smith and saying, you know, I, I, I want to concentrate on the 400 next year and what he thought was a good idea. Mm -hmm. So um, that that's what started the, the process with that. Um, I had a goal of really, you know, dropping to 45 or so. And I remember earlier in that season, I was really running some hot 350s. I was down to like 32 seconds in practice, 31s in, in the 300s, 20 points in 200s, all in practice. And um, I remember what, just before our first open, uh, our first race uh, outdoors, and I did one block start too many. And I came out of there and snatched my hamstring, something nasty, black and blue. Um, I couldn't even bend it. And so that started, of course, a rehab for the course of the whole season. So that's when you saw me at Occidental. That was like one of my first races back. To, uh, to get back, I was doing acupuncture. That's what saved me. Acupuncture with the little electrodes on it yeah. kind of got me, you know, from being 80% to all the way back to 100%. And so uh, with the limited training and coming off of rehab and just with a lot of will and 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 just a lot of will. <laughs> and, and I would say that's where your background of 800 meters came in. You missed all that yeah. time, but you had years and years and years yes. of mileage and background. And that's why right. I tell people you have a strong base you can have that eight week injury and come back because you're yeah. always fit and in shape. You, like you said, you were boxing, you were 10 mile runs. This is as a youth. Yeah. So you had years. So even coming off the injury, 
four hundred is not much for you because you... that's what I, yeah. I was like, I just need to get around this track. You know, I did I did a fifteen hundred. I remember my first race actually after the injury was a fifteen hundred, which was I was reluctant to do. Ended up going four hundred five, which I was really proud oh, wow. of. And, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was really proud yeah. of that. I was like, I don't want to go too fast. He goes, start thinking about something else. But um, then and come I qualified for Pac tens back then. It was ten schools in Pac in the Pac ten. Mm -hmm. And um, well, not for long, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and, and so um, I'm up there running the 400 with some hot, hot, hot uh, athletes in there and from Arizona and Arizona State. And um, I remember just like, was like, okay, we can do this. So we were going to run the 400 prelims, but there weren't enough people to that would qualify for it. Yeah, so, so you went straight to a final. We went straight to the final, which they I They based like it on lanes? So did they, if they went straight to a final, were you seated off lanes for the final? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I guess they just seated seated in lanes. I must have been in lane seven or so. Seven. Yeah, or eight. you probably had a slower qualifying time. That's no, yeah, saying. for sure. If they, if they go, if they go straight to a final, so qualifying, it's like, all right, well, you were the eighth seed. You're lane yeah. one or eight or so nine. So I got I got the lane out, outside lane, and uh, but I did it like Van Neeker did in the Olympics. I went out, didn't want to see anybody, but then on the turn, they all shot past me. And then that that half mile strength came in, and and the and the just the will to win, I charged down that that final stretch and became a Pac-10 champ. So looking back at it, you know, being a an adult and looking back at my the trajectory of my career, I was saying, man, if somebody just said that, you know, in no name, this athlete won two NCAA championships, yep. three time All American, yep. uh, a Pac-10 champ, you know, quality, you know. Placed in the top Pac-10, you know, three out of four years. What do you say about this last day? They had a pretty good, good year, you know, a yep. pretty good track season. Like, track I, I, I would say they had a great collegiate career. Right, great That's collegiate it. career. So it, that looking back at it, being able not to just it, it beat my beat up, beat myself on it. But there was a, a time where it was pretty tough, even especially after after running. But being it, just looking back at it now as an adult and appreciating it, especially having kids. It's like my son would do, you know, a percentage of that. I'll be through the moon. You graduated from UCLA. What did you study at UCLA? Uh, Spanish and art history and education. So art history is kind of a background of what I'm do, but more education. I thought I was going to be a teacher, so which, I, which I ended up being a teacher once I moved up to uh, uh, Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. So after that, then you move on, as you said, to play for the Nike Farm System Club yeah. professionally. Talk more about that experience, running professional track. What events did you do at that time in the early 2000s? Yeah, so that was we were trying to get get my times back down in the eight hundred. Where that was, it's uh the Nike Farm team was an Olympic development team that yeah. uh, uh for distance runners. Eight hundred was a was the uh, bottom race, and we have you know fifteen a lot of slew of fifteen hundred meter runners, five k, ten k, and steeplechase. So I was uh, the sprint, I guess the sprinter of the group. You know, me Brian Woodward was on the team. We had a number of athletes uh, around the, around the nation here training on the Stanford campus. So I remember moving up here. And seeing bike lanes, I'm yeah. like, whoa! I've never really seen bike lanes, pelotons, people with matching uniforms on the bike. I said, mm, I think I need to get a bike. And so I got a bike, uh, bike to practice. Uh, it was it was fun to, to kind of be around uh, uh, the sport again, and, and at, at a, a level where you know, semi pro, we got pretty much our tri right, uh, trips taken care of, our room and board and equipment and stuff we just have to kind of provide our own living so i worked at starbucks for a little bit and then i got a job that changed the uh changed my life uh mark guille was my uh athletic trainer at ucla and he moved he uh, after my sophomore year, he came up to stanford became their head trainer and then eventually you know to this day he's owns uh agile physical therapy but at the time we worked at a physical therapy clinic on campus and some of my athletes were like hey um there's somebody at this therapy clinic that's looking for somebody to help lead exercises. And so I biked there and got lost. I came in as the sweaty guy at the interview. <laughs> it was like, I'm looking for the, the manager for, for the position. He goes, oh, he's in that room. And I opened the door and it's Mark. I was like, Mark, what are you doing here? He goes, Michael, what are you doing here? I said, I'm looking for that job. He goes, you're hired pretty much. <laughs> and so the, yeah, just that network of that, and, you know, it was really helped me. And from that position, I, I worked, um, you know, I pretty much learned how to do everything in physical therapy from, you know, rehab to prehab, rehab, um, learning, learning the body, became a massage therapist as well. I got licensed, you know, certified massage therapy and went in to get more uh, education and being a personal trainer. So while I'm doing this, I'm still on the track 
uh, you know, training with, at Stanford, uh, learning through with uh, Coach Gags. Um, I felt like the writing was on the wall a little bit. I, I can kind of see that track wasn't really going to pan out the way I thought it was as far as going to the Olympics. My time started getting a little bit faster, but, it, you know, it's just I had some um, injuries in my ankle. I had um, posterior tip tears that was just every time I hit a turn, that just was excruciating pain to where the, the, after about two and a half years, so 2001, so yeah, 2003, I went to see the podiatrist and they said, uh, you, you need to pick up another sport because you keep running on this. It's just going to tear or you try to get it, get surgery. So at that point, I, just, I, I thought it was best to um, take my talents to being a, a, a personal trainer, a fitness instructor, and kind of use my in, uh, expertise as an athlete and at the time learning on the job with what I was doing at the physical therapy clinic. And it seemed to pay off for me in the future. Yeah, that, that, and that's an interesting story. I know Coach Gags was a Georgetown coach. I, I was on a rural relay staff in uh, Bahamas, maybe 2012. He was on the staff, but we had a four by eight. And so I, I spent some time with him. But I know he's retired from Georgetown. You said, Brian Woodward, you guys went up there. That Nike Farm team, that was great. That was like the beginning. That was like the first, I think, elite kind of yeah. team. They were sponsored. Like you got, you know, um, and so that, that was great. And but just kind of think, 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 uh, talk a little bit about that. Like you see, the writing is on the wall. Like I tell people, like, oh, you know, I knew I was gonna go into coaching. Or I knew this, so you're, kind of, yeah, you, you, you had to love it, but at the same time, like, okay, I got to start figuring out what's my next move. So. That's exactly what it was. You know, it's like, what, what's my next move? Um, I felt like the definitely being up here in, in the Bay Area was the move. I put my flag down, and I remember saying it to myself. I said, this is where I'm gonna raise a family. I like it here. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like there's opportunity. Everybody's, you know, taking me in just, just well and having, uh, and then everybody's into outdoors and, and, yeah. and taking care of yourself and health and wellness. So I said, I can definitely fit in here and learn a lot. So to the part about writing on the wall, I noticed that I wasn't as, I didn't have that nervousness before a race like I would use you. Yeah. You know, the butterfly. Not passion is before. Not yeah. Nervous. It's just out there. You're just out there. If you don't get like, I remember it's just like being out there is like, Oh, I got a race today. And I just didn't, it wasn't, it didn't hit as hard before because before you couldn't talk to me. I was, like I said earlier, I was focused, you know, times out here, I would probably, you know, stay up late or I probably, you know, would think about something else or, or, and I was as on a jog the other day, I was thinking about this question. I said, you know what? I didn't even lift the weights. I didn't lift weights in the off season. I, I you know, I just went out there and did what the coach said. And I didn't do anything extra. Like I was, you mm -hmm. know, when I was younger, I'll do the pushups on the side. I'll go out, play basketball, this and that. I think I was just, enjoying adult life um i said to myself when i moved up here i said you know all my life i've been pretty much kind of directed on what to do okay you do this this is what you're going to run this is where you're going to go to school uh this is what you're going to study you know and you know i said i had some opportunity to be myself through art uh through uh friendships and laughter and all whatnot but uh when i moved up here i said you know i'm this is michael you make the, you make the call on this you you go ahead and start figuring out what works for you and let's see and see where that takes you you uh, know, and taking the good from from my past and understanding that, you know, the things that weren't so good and seeing what I can mold for my future moving forward. So I, I noticed with that, not having the butterflies before races, not doing anything extra outside of just the practices that Gags gave me and just, you know, being a little bit more social than I would be during the season than, than times before. I noticed that was the writing on the wall. And on top of it, having that injury was just, just definitely the stamp. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. You now serve as the head coach of the Palo, Palo Alto High School track and field and cross country team in Palo Alto, California. Talk more about what that is like being the head coach of a high school track and field and cross country program. Oh, yeah, man. before you jump in, I didn't. I think Mike, when I mean, you reconnected a few years ago, you said it. they just hired me. Wasn't Patty Sue Plummer the coach or something? That's I, right. I just That's remember right. you just got. I just remember how you got thrown in. You're like, man, coach. I know I had to coach a high jumper. I know what I was doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so just before that, um. And also, Alex, we were uh, – so, so I was having my business. I started GFIT in 2015. I was working as a under, – under another business, and they kind of folded – or not folded. They decided to go another direction uh, with outdoor fitness. They wanted to go more corporate. And so they left me with and, – and all these clients kind of at bay. So we all got together and said, hey, let's, let's make a let's, – let's create – let's keep this going. So I started GFIT, got a new logo – Kept the same clientele and just learn, you know, through just entrepreneurial skills and 
and just building the plane as I flew, you know, it was just yeah. like it started G fit, which allowed me to uh, open my, my days up a little bit more to volunteer, which was my goal was to volunteer at the local, one of the local high schools, uh, we'll help out with block work or be a speaker or just whatever. And I, I approached certain uh, coaches and say, Hey, if you ever need me, you know, I would like to stop by and just offer services any kind of way. And uh, the Palo Alto high school uh, heard it, found out about that and, see my background and resume and say, you know what, we actually want you on staff. So I started off as a vice, as a vice, as an assistant coach with um, Mike Davison. He's the head coach still there at Palo Alto. And so for two years, I, I, I coached there. And just off the back, I knew that being a father more than an athlete was the was the attribute I would fall upon more as a coach. Uh, being understand to, uh, to understand to understand where, where they are. Um, there was 300 kids out there. For Man. cross country, I was not ready for that. Man, you know, I came in with my X's and O's and my plan for the year. Okay, this is what we're going to do in the preseason. This is what we're going to do in the winter. This is what we're going to do during the track season. This is the kind of workouts. And I'm thinking that these kids are like I was in high school. But no, you know, out of 300 kids, you probably got 20 of them that actually want to do it. Yeah. You know, and so in a way, you know, being able to motivate kids to get out there, uh, have, I have a very uh, jovial person. I like to laugh, I like to joke, which I think. Uh, resonated with with the with the kids then with the student athletes but then there's also comes a time where you have to really show authority because they can really run over you with those jokes every now and then and and try to take advantage of it so it was a, mm -hmm. a learning experience to be in the cool coach but also uh being an advocate of rules and and, res and responsibilities and accountability and slowly but surely we you know learning the kids names uh being out there being out there was was the best thing I could be as a coach, being being accessible, being accessible outside the track and just being that person to help them to walk them through not getting the personal record or to or to walk them through getting the personal record and being humble. So I, I was able to give them the best of both sides of saying, hey, I, I got records at this age. And then also I, I've never and then I've also been in a situation where I've never got faster at certain points and how do you still find yourself and and move around in the guise of being a team being a teammate being an athlete being a student and that was a lot what, what helped me um as a coach and then to follow up i uh uh patty sue Palmer was uh the head coach at gun and she approached me and felt that the, the team would be in good hands with me and she says uh because she was moving on to coach at texas university of texas mm -hmm. and so um at this point now, it's like the head coach. Being an assistant coach and the head coach is a whole different thing. You know, I was able to, you yeah. know, to focus on, okay, the warm-ups and the abs and this and that. But with head coach, you got emails, you got parents. Uh, you're accountable for everything that kids do and staff does. And, uh, you know, fundraising you know, up here in public schools, you got, you know, help with fundraising, uh, act, you know, making sure academics is fine, you know, being up on every kid, getting, getting coaches, uh, getting timers for meets, and so it was a great experience, you know, to really understand and to really understand what the what makes track and field flow. Yeah, so it's it's I always said being an assistant coach, you can coach into your circuit and abs and this. Yeah. And head coach, it's yeah. You might just get I, I would say I'd be walking a track, my AD would call or you know, parent yeah. call. You you yeah. just some days it was just like practice is worthless. Like you, you had to have assistants who are good. Yeah. Um, yeah you want to coach every day you want to really grind but like yeah the other stuff was real all right we got a homie we got hurdles this mom is calling fundraising right. for, and those things were superseded you know yeah and that's when you said too it's like okay i was able you got to be able to trust you got to um you know have a good uh preseason plan communication with coaches is really powerful and which i felt my you know entrepreneurial skills and leadership skills really helped out through there and then also being, and you know, trust is a, is a big part. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, but trying to be able to hire, you know, uh, uh, coaches to, for, for shot, for the field shot put. And this is luckily there was a, a, a Patty Sue left a, a great slew of coaches that were there, but we didn't have a high jump coach. Yep. And so I, I had that point, I was so, I had my, I was so salivating because I had a strong half miler on the team another good quarter mile here and a hurdler. And I felt like I was going to, Oh, and there was like this, uh, a girl that did a strong 15 and three, uh, five K and stuff. So I was like, okay, we're, uh, um, no, it was three K, right. 3,200. So 3, she was yeah. 3,200. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna work with them. And then all of a sudden I was like, well, we don't have a whole high, uh, high jump coach. So 
I delegated, you know, my assistant coaches to take care of them. I talked with the 800 meter runner. I said, okay, do this and that. And, but you got, you got them just report to me. And here I am looking at my USATF, you know, certification book and looking at the high jump part. It's like, okay, here we go. <laughs> it's yeah. workouts. And, and it was, it was one of those where you, you took them through, we learned together. We, we went up there, we had fun. We worked hard and the team stayed, stayed together the whole time. You know, we got some PRs um, and it was one of those two. We started seeing, other athletes pulling in from the hundred and long jump to come and participate. And one thing I want that led me to believe was, you know, let me, I'm not just going to be a coach just for the sprinters or just for the fast people. I want to be available to everybody on the field. And I remember walking over every practice. I would walk to each, the hurdlers, the jumpers, the throwers, yeah. and just come in and just, and the people who are injured or the, or the team uh, statistics, just come and have a, a conversation rapport with them. And something really what really resonated with me. One of the athletes came to me, he goes, I've never had a coach uh, from the track park come over to the field. It's always felt like two different teams. I was like, well, not with this coach. I'm glad no. you said that. But in that right there really resonated with me to to make the team as a community, and which which is really cool. At uh, one season, I had perfect uh, participation as far as everybody donated to the to the cause. Everybody you know, was was cheering each other on throughout different parts of the meet. And to me, I, I, you know, we had, we won uh, the sportsmanship award and each time, each season I had somebody represented in the state meet. So I think I was really happy as a, as a head coach, I checked the boxes that I wanted to check, but a lot of that stuff changed once the pandemic happened though. Yeah. yeah I tell people being, being a head coach, I liked it. I'm a, I always loved the system stuff, but um, I've always considered myself a businessman. You're in business now. Yeah. You're a head coach, you're CEO. Yeah. I love how you said it. there was little things I would do. I would just, you go to this practice, you go see these throw. Oh, they yeah. never even come over to see me before. You know, you hear yeah. those stories. Yeah. You you know, you're in charge of the whole program. Don Stramit said that we were talking about him. We interviewed North Ridge. Yeah. He, say, he said, man, I went track. I had to cut like my distance budget. He goes, and that hurt me because I was a distance coach, but he goes, it allowed me to win in track. And I was always around the other people. And they, they were just as more important to me than, my athletes and yeah. you know that I personally coach. So yeah, that's the truth. So yeah, let's <laughs> talk more about the G Fit Boot Camp program that you run. It's an outdoor training circuit that incorporates modalities like TRX, weights, battle ropes, and jump ropes into a comprehensive training routine. Let's talk more to the audience out there just about the fundamentals and the regimen and the overall program of G Fit Boot Camp. G G Fit, we put the unity in community too. Uh, it's it's um uh, we have as outdoor, like you say, outdoor fitness. And what I like to do is, is provide a whole general fitness workout program throughout the week. Um, Mondays, we uh, bring track to the, to the, um, to the workout. So we'll go out there and uh, teach them the fundamentals of running. Uh, and we'll do little intervals around the track uh, mixed in with some, uh, everything is mixed in with the calisthenics, body weight work, yeah. abs and balance. Tuesdays and Thursdays, we do more weight training. Uh, Wednesdays, I call it, we do more hit circuit trainings with battle ropes, TRX, like you said, agility, work on agility. And Fridays are our longer run. So over a month, we try to work on, you know, somebody can come every day or somebody comes, oh, I just want to do Tuesdays and Thursdays. But the idea is, is to come as you are. I have uh, clients that are in their 80s. I have clients that, that come that in their 30s, early 20s. But everybody works out together. And the fun part about uh, the, what, what I love about the boot camp with GFIT is it's the conversations that go along with each other in, in the, and without the class within the hour, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's the community that they, that they, the friendships and the bonds that they have through sweat equity to do working out. And they, a lot of these uh, boot campers hang out after they do orienteering with each other after they have, they go to weddings, they have dinners, they go to vacations with each other, they play pickleball mm -hmm. and they all bring it back and say, thanks to, thanks to you, Michael, we have this group of friends that we can, and like minds to do other stuff with. So yes, I like to go out there and give them a, a, an array of exercises with proper form, uh, but with the variety. So you're not going to see the same workout twice in, within a month, but then at the same time, open it up to be very um, uh, family friendly, dog friendly. And that, that seemed to be the, the glue for what, why I've been able to do it since 2015 and 2006 as, a, as an elite instructor. That was awesome. Thank was you. I hear exactly what you're saying. Like I, I train clients and you end up having all these clients and they, I have a kid from inner city. I have a kid from Newport beach. I have a kid from Harbor Westlake and they all 
are good and working together. And I say, you guys need to connect and you guys need to network. And you got yeah. all different sides of the stream. This is going to help you. I tell right. like, Westlake kid, this is going to help you know, and they, they're, they're, they're the poor kid. Poor yeah. kid, this is going to help you being connected with this guy. Or And, and um, it just, it, it, it sets you up for life. But like you said, a lot of you, these people go on vacation together. You yeah. know, you brought them together. They're working out. They're, they like get when, when would they have ever seen each other? Like you said, you know, from the different parts of, of the town and for them to come together through you, you know, as the glue, it's just one of those magical, like just forms that connections and through, through community. And that's something where I've learned uh, that it's, this is more than just X and O's like what I did as, as a head coach, you know, it wasn't just, not just more about who, how many pushups and stuff we do during class or who can, you know, run the fastest mile It's doing it together and, and having that conversation and, and, and the dad jokes flow well when you're a little bit tired, you know, it, yeah. things hit at the right time. So, you know, just to let you know too, what we like, I like to do with the boot camp is, is to is to do some team bonding events right now in May, and we're having a push up challenge month. But instead of just trying to thinking about how many push ups you can do, how many push ups can you contribute to the whole crew? So I said, I think as a boot camp, and I have uh, consistently about forty or fifty people that I come throughout the day, wow. and maybe about eighty throughout the month. You know, at different times, you know, daily. And I said, can we all put our ourselves together? And on, it, the, on the honor system, I set up a spreadsheet, put everybody's names on it and says, if you, you know, just add to push-ups and I see if we can get in 20,000 push-ups for the month. Today is May 4th. We're already at 8,200. There you go. You know, and it's just a way for them to see that they're a piece of the whole pie. And in the, in the mix of it, it's a way of like my dad would do, kind of trick me into working out, but by, by, you know, thinking about other stuff where, but with them, I'm kind of manipulating the work them to think about working out outside the class but in a way by putting them into the idea of being a part of a community. So in 2017, you come full circle, you write a powerful Dear Younger Me article on Mile Split. I've read it before. Um, but yeah, we've kind of talked about it. But yeah, talk, talk about that, man. It was very, it was straight to, it, it showed your, man, If I was like, wow, this is this is very hard written. And, and yeah. this, is some, this is some good advice. My buddy Ty Law did the same thing. He's in a Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yeah. He did he did a heartwarming story. Like I remember right before he got in the Hall of Fame, he said, Chris, I'm gonna sing this story. And it was like him in high school going towards the NFL, like decisions yeah. he's make, what he needs to sell. And he and he started he started talking about uh, the younger me, what I would go yeah. back and do if I so yeah, I, yeah. I, just, I loved it. You're about 40 years old and you're giving advice to your 18 year old self. Exactly. Yeah. So just knowing what um so I had some few Places to start, I thought I was going to start uh, of which younger self I was going to talk to, meaning what age, um, and then progressing into the, you know, the life I was living now. And then the whole idea was to tell that young Michael in, in, in a room, just wondering where his, where the future is going to take him. And, 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 and to say that, you know, uh, knowing, I remember myself as a younger person wanting to be a family man, being a father and wondering what my kids would look like if they would do this and kind of putting that younger minds, that younger Michael's mind at ease. So um, a big part of me wanted to start that um, from that position because I remember, yeah, <laughs> I think this is right. It was, I remember wanting to get the recording of that, of my time because I was doing some talks at the time at, at Stanford and I wanted to be a part of my public speaking uh, engagement by showing the race. And I, I knew my dad had it, but, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't release, release, release it for a long time. And then I remember calling again and, and he says he doesn't have it or something and it was gone. And that kind of put me in a, in a more deeper train of thought of, of, of wanting to remember that day a little bit more. And I spoke with my mom and I started to remember the day and not, and cause a lot of people would, will bring up, obviously the, will bring up that, that record that I broke but not knowing what I was going through that day of not even wanting to run anymore after that. And a lot of, so I would paint a nice picture or paint a very nice facade. I was like, oh yeah, it was a great time. I wanted that record. I'm glad I got it. But in the back of my head, I knew exactly what I, what went on that day and that night and, you know, countless days or stuff beforehand. And so I remember talking to my mom and, and saying and discussing with her, uh, what I was going to write about and kind of going over some of the the key moments that I kind of forgot but wanted to get her her insight on it so I knew it was just one thing in my mind and as she was explaining what happened and it reminded me of more of what was going on especially with what I was getting an award for and 
And so I um, uh, wrote, wrote, uh, wrote, that, wrote that letter to myself, just kind of saying, I know this is what you feel like. And you feel like just not going out the run. That's right. I, I remember now I was, I was talking to myself the night after I broke it. It was that person I was talking to. And I, and I told it myself, uh, it was in a way it was like, keep pressing on. You're going to be, your name is going to be synonymous with pressing on and, and, and reinventing yourself and, and doing good things, being a, per, a good part of person, going to grow up and have a beautiful family, going to run a business. And so, and so my whole idea was just saying, you know, don't take stuff personal. I know things are, is there, or there's going to be other things that's going to make you feel like this sad, but this moment is going to help you make it through. So just press through, get a good night's sleep. Your life's going to be fine. Just get yourself out in the morning and, and uh, go out there and finish the business, you know, and, and like you're going to continue to do. So something from that story there, um, um, there's a guy I uh, that read the story. And I think before I was able to finish Finish it. I, you can, I, I, I don't know if I put the story of the note I, I got from this gentleman. Um, and he said, Michael, um, he knew about the story. He says, Michael, I'm so glad that you end up running the next day. He goes, you don't know me. We didn't. We, we met through Instagram. And he said him and his father was going through something throughout their life. He's told, he told me he told me a lot about him and his 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 father and the ups and downs they had. And the bond that they, one bond that they did have was through track and field. Well, his dad really liked track and field and his the, his siblings grew up in track and field. And his father felt that there was um, a big chance that I was going to break the record that weekend. And he, he was reading the paper. He said, son, let's go ahead and get down there. I think we're going to see something special. I think grandpa is going to do it this weekend. So they drove from Northern California to Cerritos uh, to see me run. And he said the conversations that they had on that way down really bonded them like they really kind of got things out in the open and the relationship you know was was really pushing in the right direction the father and the son the friend the laughter all through the bond of track and field and seeing this guy trying to break a record they um through the course of them getting down there they was late to see me break the record you know so they went got checked into the hotel it's like okay we'll check them out tomorrow they get up, read the paper, and it's like he tells his son, "What? He broke the record last night," and that became a whole another story. But then it's like, "Well, let's see him do it today." And he told me it was great, and in a way, kind of like in the future, telling, thanking me for what I did in the past of what I was going through the night before to still tell myself to make it because there's somebody else that's gonna that's there to see you run, and it's gonna make their life, uh, their life and relationship a lot better through what the choices you just made, not even knowing them. And that just flipped my mind out, just even so thankful to myself and saying, thank you for going out there and finishing the, finishing the job. So that that's pretty much like the story. I can, I'm gonna have to go read it again, you know, just not thinking about it, but no, it, it was a big part too. It was a big um, ode to my mom and giving her a voice and letting her know, you know, a lot of people know about me and my dad, but my mom and I were really close. Um, I was, we would call me a mother's boy. Uh, she, you know, we, we are, we're the, you know, best friends. We laugh and, and uh, so she's a big part of that mess. And I was glad I was able to put her name out and her voice out in that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it was, I thought it was phenomenal to hear it. And I know, I think a lot of people just said, wow, we didn't know this. You just see you on the track. Uh, yeah. I, for me, last, last thing, I'm a big fan. I'm so glad I've had you on here. Thank you. Um, you know, I've told people on my Facebook and stuff we're doing this. There's people super excited. Like you, uh, it's awesome. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's 20, 30 years later, but, right? Um, just say, say say something to the people. Say something to your fan base. You still got oh. fans out there. You oh, man, that's you. awesome. Hey, you guys, uh, tell them what you're doing. Say, yes. you know, your kids are out there running. It's, yeah. Hey, if you if you need, I'm I'm an open. Uh, I mean, messages are open. I'm always uh, trying to give advice and any kind of motivation. Um, I'm I'm a fan of the sport. Um, I'm your uh, I'm I'm there for you. Just use me as a resource. Um, also, too, if you're in town, come to G Fit. We'll work out together. Maybe get some tea. Um, also, too, I'm a, I'm a fan of art. You know, if you want me to yeah. you know, paint paint your kid doing doing the hurdles or something, let me know. But uh, but at the same time, I I, I just want to be. Uh, uh, continue being your friend on Facebook, everybody's friend on Facebook, uh, on Instagram, 
uh, motivational speaker, if, if you need, or just somebody to, you know, just to talk track to about or talk art, you know, or just, you know, by any sport, pretty much go Lakers. You know, yep, you know, that's but, right. Go Lakers, yeah, go Dodgers. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I'm a people person. I, I, I love the smile. So, yeah, you know, I'm just happy to be a part of the conversation over, you know, almost 30 years from breaking that amazing record. And um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the sport, what I need to say. And I'm cheering on all the athletes out there. And I'm thankful to be able to uh, know certain people's names like Brandon Miller and Cade Flat, you know, and and to know, see them growing. I think Mo, to see them growing in the sport is something that I know what it feels like to be at that level so young. But to see them take it to an, to another level for for the sport, for this country, you know, for humankind, man, I, I love it. Love to be a part of the conversation. Well, Michael Ranville, it's been a pleasure. Really enjoyed hearing your story. You've had an Thank unbelievable you. youth career. And I know you're doing a great job coaching and training people of all ages in Palo Alto and just the overall Bay Area. Thank you for coming on the program. Thank right. you. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Well applied. I'll talk to you soon, buddy. All right. All right. Bye now.